I have a chapter in the book called Abraham Bound and Unbound, and it's about the binding of Isaac. That is, Isaac is bound on the altar, and he is about to be sacrificed to God. Abraham is not bound, so why do I call the chapter Abraham Bound and Unbound? Because I think the story is really about the testing of Abraham. As the Bible makes clear, God tested Abraham. The test is not of Isaac. And what interests me here is the idea that Abraham, when he was a child, and this is a very important Midrashic tradition, when he was a child, his father, who was a merchant of idols, was very angry that Abraham had broken his idols and hauled Abraham up before the court of the king, uh, basically handing him over for execution. Now, one doesn't always think of the story that way, but the Midrash actually emphasizes it, emphasizes the idea that really the father was killing his child. That Abraham's father effectively was killing his child by handing him over to, to the arm of the law. Uh, and he was thrown into a fiery furnace. The king threw him into this, this fire and he was miraculously saved. The question that I'm left with then from a psychoanalytic point of view is what would this have done to Abraham? Such an experience. To know that your father actually had the, that zeal that zeal in his eyes and just took you and handed you over to death. What happens as a sequel to that story also is that uh, the king then asks Abraham's younger brother, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of, of, of God or on the side on my side? And the younger brother, seeing that Abraham was saved, opts for God and he is thrown into a fiery furnace and he is not saved. So that there's something, a terribly traumatic implication in all this, if you take this midrash seriously, um, which I do, and which many co traditional commentaries take, they take it very seriously. The idea somewhere would be that Abraham lives his life after that, knowing that his father wanted to kill him, and that in fact his younger brother died at that very moment, and that he is somehow implicated in that too. What would that do to a person? And so my sense is that when God speaks to Abraham, and tells him, take your son and sacrifice him. This is going to be a very complicated message for Abraham to take on because he's going to have inner voices in him that will be questioning, where does that come from? Is that from God or is it from Satan? And Hasidic writers actually play with this question, this feeling of uncertainty. Again, we come back to, to that, that feeling of not being sure when you hear the voice of God, how can you be 100% sure that it is the voice of God? Certainly for a modern person, that would be a very real question. Uh, in the Bible, we assume that when God speaks, everyone can recognize it and there's no question about it. But I think this is the one story where we can legitimately ask, is Abraham absolutely sure? that this is the voice of God because of his own history. Perhaps there's something in him that's pushing him to do the same thing to his children, to his child, as was done to him. And it's, it's an almost unspeakable idea that there is some impulse, a kind of catharsis, to deal with what was left in him from that ch his own childhood experience by doing the same thing to his beloved son, Isaac. And so, till the last moment, God gives him three days to think about it. Why doesn't God just jump it on him right away? It's as if God wants to put him through a process in which he is really facing all the implications of the whole situation. And he makes the final decision in a flash of a second. When does he make the final decision? When he hears the voice of the angel calling out, Abraham, Abraham, twice. Why does the angel have to call twice? Does Abraham not hear the first time? And so, following Hasidic sources, I suggest that the first time he's in a trance. He's in some kind of trance where he's set on doing it. And so he doesn't hear God calling and stopping. But by the time the angel calls the second time, Abraham is awake again, and he is able to hear that voice that says, no, don't do it. And that's the greatness of Abraham, that he's gone through a certain process that has allowed him that wakeful moment that has taken him through a trance, through a whole, what the analysts call it, working through. Working through all the tensions and trauma of his life and then waking up at the crucial moment to recognize, ah, that's, that's the voice of the angel now. 
um, there's a great deal more to this, but, um, but I find this fascinating, again, because of its relation to modern life and to the way in which we understand trauma um, and to the way in which we create ourselves very largely through our attempts to work through traumatic events from our childhoods. They needn't be of such horror, but uh, trauma is now used in a rather wide sense. Um, and it seems to me that human beings are quite preoccupied in dealing with these childhood things in order to become free to do the, the morally and spiritually um, helpful thing, the thing that will create rather than destroy.